Good afternoon and welcome to the Columbia World Leaders Forum. Uh, I'd like to recognize the Harriman Institute for co-sponsoring this event um, and thank the many faculty, staff and students who have made it possible. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome our distinguished guest today, Tomas Hendrik Ilves, President of the Republic of Estonia. Uh, President Ilves is no stranger to Law Library uh, or to our campus. Some of you may know that he graduated from Columbia College um, in 1976. Uh, this World Leaders Forum event is therefore a special source of pride for us all, uh, reminding us once again that a Columbia education truly prepares our students to be society's leaders. Um, indeed, President Ilves has said that the insights he gained from contemporary civilization um, have been an invaluable guide as he has navigated the intricacies of Eastern European politics. Um, before I introduce President Ilves properly, I'd like to take a moment to uh, say a few words about the World Leaders Forum. Um, in 2003, our, our President Lee Bollinger launched the forum as a university-wide initiative to promote open discussion about the most pressing issues facing the world. For 10 years, we have welcomed heads of state to campus to engage in a free exchange of ideas with our students, faculty, and staff. Um, it is an experience that would be almost impossible to replicate in any other city or any other university. President Bollinger and the rest of the university leadership are very pleased that this week we are scheduled to have 13 heads of state visit Columbia the largest number to address our university community during the annual September convening of the, the UN General Assembly. Thomas Ilves became fourth president of Estonia in 2006 and won re-election to a second five-year term in 2011. He began his career in public service 20 years ago as the country's ambassador to the United States and has held a number of high-profile offices since then, including Minister for Foreign Affairs, Member of the Estonian Parliament and Member of the European Parliament. His rise up the ladder of Estonian politics is all the more remarkable given his background. Born in Sweden to Estonian parents who had fled their homeland, he grew up not far from here in Leonia, New Jersey. After graduating from Columbia College, he earned a master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania and then moved to Germany to work for Radio Free Europe. When he was asked to serve as Estonia's US ambassador, he embraced the opportunity. The years of Mr. Ilva's presidency have been among the most transformative in Estonia's long history. After eight centuries of virtually uninterrupted rule by foreign powers, the recent period of national independence has allowed Estonia to blossom. Today, the Estonian people enjoy a tremendous degree of freedom and a prosperous society bolstered by membership in the European Union and NATO, a healthy relationship with the United States, and a stable economy that has weathered the global financial crisis more successfully than most. President Ilves has come here today to talk about two intertwined issues. Um, that we've been reading about in the press on a daily basis, internet freedom and cybersecurity. Estonia was the victim of an aggressive cyber attack in 2007, and its response has established the nation as a leader on the challenge of cybersecurity, an issue that will be at the center of national security debates uh, for years to come. In addition, Estonia has been grappling with the tension between the power of digital communication to democratize society and the significant dangers posed by corporate and government surveillance now possible on an unprecedented scale. Please join me in welcoming a world leader with a Columbia pedigree, a firm grasp of the modern world, and a richly international perspective, President Tomas Hendrik Ilves. Well, thank you very much. It's really great to be back here. Uh, let me just ask so I know how to talk. Uh, how, many, uh, how many of you here are from the college, Barnard, or, uh, or engineering and have to uh, or do take CC in humanities? Just to pick up. Okay. Well, that's then good. Because <laughs> basically, that's probably the, uh, I would say, uh, the most important thing that, uh, that you will feel several years from now about having gotten something from Columbia. Uh, when I look back, when I was at Columbia, which was in the middle 70s, which was actually the nadir of the undergraduate experience at Columbia, and any dean, any uh, alumnus will tell you that was the nadir of Columbia. It was also when Ford said drop dead to New York City. It was not very happy. But back in the 1970s, society was at a, in, in the United States was at a crossroads, culturally, economically, and politically. War weariness dominated the national mood, and everyone was worried about a rising economic power, Japan, uh, which would soon eclipse the United States' global dominance. Uh, then there were other good things happening. The, there was another emerging, <laughs> emerging powerhouse, at least at CBGB's in Max's Kansas City, the Ramones. 
The floppy disk had just been invented and the first personal computers were about to break upon the world. The Cold War is at its peak and world politics was uh, much more predictable. Those were the good old days. Of course, in some sense, you can say this is plus a chance, plus a la même chose. On the other hand, you can also say that those concerns, while clearly important at the time, today have little relevance. What has remained, however, for me at least, is what I thought were merely requirements to be fulfilled when I was at Columbia College, CC, Humanities, and at my time you just had a, you had a science requirement. Uh, everything else has changed. My country was occupied uh, under Soviet domination back then. Today it's independent. I mean, for me, that's the, probably the biggest change, of course. But what I do is that I repeatedly return to the text that I read at Columbia since I find that uh, that really provides the guidance I need to make sense of how to, how to push forward with a, in, forging, creating, and uh, maintaining a liberal democracy uh, in a part of Europe where the history of uh, liberal democracy is, is weak at best. So I'm not going to really talk more about that, but I did want to sort of tell everyone that what you're doing is, what you are taking here, is really, really important and you will notice how important it is as the years go by and whatever you learn here becomes obsolete or forgotten but what you do in the core is of fundamental importance and why I think no other university really in the United States at the undergraduate level offers anything as good. But today I'm going to talk about uh, other things which are related in many ways but nonetheless it's, uh, it's a different topic. And that is the transformative power of technology, um, the use of IT uh, to actually transform society, uh, and also a whole series of strategic, strategic issues that rise out of that. Uh, really, there's a triangle of issues we have to sort of deal with on the one hand, and perhaps people are more aware of these uh, in the last three months, but on the one hand you have real concerns about security, you have real secu uh, concerns about privacy, and then you have real concerns about liberty and freedom. Um, you, can, you can solve any two of the three fairly easily. Uh, you can have security uh, and freedom, but then you don't have privacy. You can have uh, freedom and privacy, but then you don't have security and so on. Triangulating those issues uh, is one of the core tasks I think any liberal democracy will face in the coming century, and I can't really foresee further than that, unfortunately. Uh, I can foresee less than that, but anyway. But anyway, Estonia, in case you don't know, I was going to show something here, but I couldn't. But anyway, it's basically a very small country, about the same size as the Netherlands, Denmark, the state of Maryland, Virginia, and New Hampshire put together. I mean, if you take those two states, that's, um, we're even smaller in population, and we endured five decades of backwardness from Soviet occupation. Uh, yet, in the past 22 years, we have leapt out of that backward phase and have become, uh, in many areas, probably the first in the world in use of IT, which always astounds people until they come and visit us and see what we're doing, and then, uh, then they change their minds. Uh, but we, when we look at where we are today, we have to understand that what has happened when, in the past 20 years with, uh, with the web, with our interconnected way of life, really represents a, a sped up version of the kind of change that we went through during a century of industrialization from the, uh, from the very end of the 18th century to the 19th. It's a paradigmatic, those of you who are still, if they still teach TS, I mean Thomas Kuhn's uh, structure of science, uh, scientific revolutions, that's still taught here in CC, yes, no? Anyway, it wasn't my day. Good book, read it, you need it. It is one of those core texts. But anyway, it is a paradigmatic transformation of our world, uh, including a paradigmatic change of notions of what a nation's size, wealth, and power means, where 
military might population numbers and g d p relations mean something altogether different than they did back before we all had computers and this is in constant flux like the tag balloons that you see if you read the economist these relations are changing all the time things get bigger and smaller some countries some countries become very important some countries are eclipsed it's where a small poor east european country of twenty years ago today is a leader in cyber security and e governance and where a number of large countries remain stuck in the technology of the twentieth century advanced as we are uh, we also have become to a horribly mixed metaphors here something of a proverbial canary in a minefield in the area of cybersecurity uh, exposed to the vulnerabilities of our societies that all of us will face as we become more and more connected and computerized this is especially true in a country like mine where ninety eight percent of bank transactions are done online ninety eight percent of prescriptions are done online so you can go if you have a if you need a prescription you go to any pharmacy because it's all online you just take out your prescription uh, all basically all uh, income tax returns have been done online since the uh, late nineties our last in our last election twenty five percent of the population voted very securely online so twenty five percent of the electorate uses our rather unique system to vote online our land registry that only exists digitally it's not even on paper anymore we stopped that about uh, ten years ago um, and the entire country is connected by Wi-Fi uh, of course, this leads to some interesting paradoxes. The more sophisticated you are, the more vulnerable you are, uh, the more, uh, the easier it is to hurt you. Uh, I remember back when I was a young person, uh, people talked about if there were ever an atomic bomb, the only creatures that would survive would be the cockroaches, because they're so primitive, so too in a cyber world. If you are very sophisticated in cyber, then if you get attacked, uh, and you're highly dependent upon the use of uh, the internet and communication systems, then you're, you, you're wiped out. If, on the other hand, you don't have any uh, serious connections, no s real services online, then an attack, a cyber attack will, clearly will not have much, much of an effect. All this became clear to us actually a few years after we went gung-ho on uh, on computerizing society when we were when in the uh, in April of May April May 2007 we were uh, subject to uh, something I'll explain in a minute but to a series of DDoS attacks do people know what DDoS is here some people no okay well basically a DDoS DDoS attack is stands for a uh, distributed denial of service attack. That's where the DDoS comes from. The way it works is simple. You basically deluge a server with hundreds of thousands of pings. It is unable to respond and it just shuts down. Uh, now, the way these things work or do are done um, is that about 25% of the PCs in the world, a smaller number of Macs, uh, have been hijacked and uh, when you're not using their, the computer they're being used by someone else and this, these computers are called bots. It comes from the word robot which comes from Karl Chapek's play of the same name which is where the word robot came from. But anyway, bots are in your computer uh, and uh, your computer, if you are infected by a bot, is run by someone else. Uh, if you put a lot of bots together, several hundred thousand, they're called botnets, standing for bot networks. And these are all illegal and they are controlled by mafia style criminal organizations. Most of these, most, uh, virtually all of the spam you get, you know, all those Viagra ads written with funny letters, so to. to to get your get past your spam filter those you get because someone's a whole bunch of people's computers have been hijacked and they're sending them all out 
Well, what, uh, the way a DDoS attack works is that instead of sending lots of spam all over the place, they concentrate on a few, a few computers and they just overload them and the computer goes nuts. Um, sorry to digress on the technical stuff, but unfortunately I think you will, we will all have to know a little bit of technology in order to survive in the future because, because if you don't know that stuff, you're not going to understand what's going on around. Anyway, so we suddenly found ourselves in 2007 uh, on the cybersecurity map because we were the first country to come under comprehensive, overwhelming attack uh, on the computer. Uh, who did it? It's very hard to pinpoint, but thinking back to CC and David Hume, uh, if you've read your David Hume, then uh, David Hume did say that we assume the two events in close proximity, proximity temporal proximity, are causal, causally related, and what was going on at the time, we were having a little conflict with our neighbor because we wanted to uh, take down a statue or move a statue to dedicate it to a Soviet soldier that was causing a lot of problems domestically, causing all kinds of domestic uh, unpleasantness. And so in, uh, in doing so, uh, basically Russia organized a, an attack on us and our country was pretty well shut down for all intents and purposes. You couldn't take any money out of banks. The banks did not work because all the, everyone uses a computerized banking service. Government sites were down. Even the emergency number, you have 911 and Europe is 112. That was shut down. So it was not in, we were not in good shape. Um, well, I mean, what does this mean? Uh, this was a continuation of policy by other means, which we all know from uh, von Clausewitz is the definition of war. Uh, so this was the first clear-cut case of, of the use of cyber in aggression. Uh, it has a number of lessons which I'll come back to, but one of the first is that um, we, we could never be and are ne can never be sure who did it. Difficulty of attribution is one of the fundamental problems of cyber conflict because you don't know where it came from. In the good old days, you could always see a rock, an arrow, uh, even a missile. You know where it came from, uh, but you don't know with cyber. In fact, you may not even know that you're being hit until it really becomes an issue, but you don't know who did it. And of course, difficulty, the difficulty of attribution makes a response, both in terms of uh, an appropriate and proportional response, becomes a real difficulty. So what is it? What is it if your, your, your system is knocked out uh, by a cyber attack? I mean, in the good old days, uh, you know, if someone blows up your electrical plant, you blow up their electrical plant. But if someone shuts down your electrical plant through a cyber attack, you may not even know it was a cyber attack until several, several months later. Let's recall the whole Stuxnet thing. Why were these centrifuges blowing up? Maybe for a long time, no one had a clue. Uh, so you don't know who did it. You don't know what's going on. Uh, and so the attribution issue is clearly one for security people to think about. The United States has solved that problem on its own. We can't do that this way, but the U.S. Department of Defense said already two years ago that if you, uh, that a cyber attack in cyberspace need not be met with the say in the same domain, which is a polite way of saying that if you sort of give us malware, we will shoot a missile at you. Uh, uh, but we, we don't, we, we have a, we have less opportunities or fewer opportunities to do that. But in any case, since that time, things have changed dramatically. I did mention Stuxnet. That's a whole different realm. The kind of stuff that we had, the uh, distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks, they are really very basic. Uh, when we get to Stuxnet, when we get to Dooku, when we get the kind of new things that we're seeing, uh, they are of a completely different order of magnitude. And they can attack things which I'll have to get technical again. Uh, which really run our society, and those are SCADA systems. This is another term it would be helpful to learn what's, what a SCADA system is. That's a supervisory control and data acquisition system. Basically, everything in the world today is run on the Internet via supervisory control and data acquisition, or SCADA systems. These are, I mean, basically everything that, from the milk delivery in your supermarket, 
to the way your traffic lights work, uh, to uh, clearly nuclear power stations, electrical generating stations, water pumps, you name it, everything has in the past 20 years gone, has been computerized, and the way it all works is through feedback systems, which are all computerized, and this was the way the, the centrifuges in Iran worked, because they would uh, they would spin and there would be a there would be a feedback system that say now slow it down now speed it up uh, now if you can manipulate that you can shut them down which is what whoever did it we have our guess but whoever did, sh caused those uh, centrifuges to go nuts uh, did so but the same thing can happen just as well with your electrical system your supermarkets being having milk delivered to you uh, or your traffic lights. And if you think about it, you know, your traffic light system in New York is run by a computer. You, start manip you, start, you can manipulate that the way last year in L.A. someone did, and you turn all the lights red at the same time. You can imagine what a mess it is. Even bigger mess, turn all the r lights green at one time. Then you're really in trouble. But anyway, these are the kinds of threats that we see in the future. Now, when it comes to the, a number of phenomena in cyberspace today, especially the DDoS attacks that I mentioned, which basically came down to a, a group, people, criminal groups that make their money spamming now being hired to, to uh, shut down computers, or when we look at hacking groups that, uh, that are uh, going into all kinds of things, basically stealing intellectual property, but doing other things as well. It's a, they all represent a unique form of that favorite term of government's PPP, public-private partnership. But the public-private partnership in this case is not between the company building your highway and the state government, it's between a government and a mafia group or a criminal organized gang. Um, and, and not that this is an altogether new phenomenon. If you think of the Barbary pirates under the Ottoman Empire, uh, it was the same deal. I mean, the Ottoman Empire had the Sultan in, in Istanbul had perfect deniability. He just had these pirates in Tripoli, as in from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. You remember that from history? Yes. Anyway, the, uh, the Barbary pirates were working on commission, and they took some stuff, but the uh, Sultan never did anything. Uh, and this is, uh, this, this, is where, this is the kind of threats, these are the kinds of threats we see today that offer deniability, that allow governments to do things without really getting their hands dirty, but someone is doing it. Uh, because, of course, uh, criminal organizations don't do things for free. They have to be paid. And who has the resources to pay them? I mean, they're not politically motivated. Their criminal groups are completely apolitical. So if a government says, look, we'd like you guys to go and shut down the Estonians, they'll do that. But they say, you know, how much does it cost? And proof of that was when we actually looked at the, the attacks on in real time, or actually afterwards, looked at the time of the attacks. It was not a normal Gaussian distribution that you think it gets higher and then gets lower. It was completely discrete. It started at zero, zero. 0000 zero, 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 Greenwich Mean Time ended at 24 zero, 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 Greenwich Mean Time. I had said, this is impossible. Why do you have this kind of distribution? And the guy who was in charge of monitoring just said, well, the money ran out. And I said, what do you mean the money ran out? And he said, they only bought 24 hours a time. So, you know, they started at midnight, ended at midnight. Now, from here, we can go beyond into more interesting cases, or at least more uh, problematic cases, where you begin to integrate the cyber world with the kinetic world. Kinetic uh, is this new term uh, by, used by the military. Uh, it's all the stuff of war, uh, but now because we, we have digital, it now you call the other stuff kinetic. You know, anything that flies, hits, kills, rockets, stones, arrows, you know, whatever. I mean, those are all kinetic. They're moving in space. And so we saw already in the uh, Georgian-Russian War of 2008, uh, there are a number of articles on this if you're interested, uh, where to soften up before missile attacks and air attacks, they shut down the web in the area. 
that they were going to attack. So no one had any, the communications were wiped out, and so he had a bigger effect, as again, Clausewitz would call, would call this increasing the fog of war. Um, and again, this gives us a uh, reason to worry about how we're moving in the future. Now, I talked about SCADA systems as sort of the, the next phase um, where, which we have seen in the case of Stuxnet, but which worries most people today when, it, when we think about cybersecurity. And it worries people for a very good reason, because the, this, these kinds of vulnerabilities um, are completely outside of the realm of the military, and one could argue that the vulnerabilities of everything we do in society today that depends on computers, in fact, renders the military irrelevant, or can render the military irrelevant. Because militaries have grown up and have developed ever since we started throwing rocks at each other to defend territory. Because what mattered was that if you really wanted to do something, you'd take over the territory with your bows and arrows or with your tanks. But you don't have to do that anymore. You can just shut down the territory and nothing is going to work there. And if you want to, to say, impoverish a country, you can simply erase their banking records. Uh, you can erase the data on the stock exchange. Now imagine what would happen in the United States if someone erased all of the data on the stock exchange or if they erased all of the data in your banks. Uh, you don't, the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marines aren't going to help you very much with that problem. So uh, we can think in terms of cybersecurity as, um, as, a, as a new form of potential warfare. It hasn't been used yet. We don't know people haven't been killed by cyber, but certainly it can be used to achieve military objectives. And I would argue it can render the, the world's greatest fighting force uh, into a pile of metal, an F-35 fighter plane, and a supercarrier can just be a piece of legacy technology. I don't want to scare you about all this. I'm just saying that we have to understand what the potential of all of this is as we move further and further into d dependency upon, upon the cyber world to run our lives. Now, the, um, the kinds of issues that, uh, is, that we see here also change power relationships. Uh, you don't have to be the greatest military power on earth, which the United States currently is, in order to actually have a, be, have, be a significant force in the world. Uh, you can, in fact, achieve all kinds of things. I mean, even a little tiny East European country like ours actually can do a lot. Uh, we don't do bad things because we'd rather be on the sort of the good side, good, the good guy side, but nonetheless, that it's, it's kind of like the Colt, which used to be called the, the great equalizer in the, in the late 19th century, because, I mean, you can do things with a Colt that you couldn't do before, Colt 45 gun, that is. Um, and so we have to look at cyber conflict and cybersecurity no longer in a symmetrical state-to-state -state paradigm from which we viewed all of this since the Peace of Westphalia uh, in 1648, and did until about uh, 9-11, 2001, when we realized that asymmetrical conflict, in fact, can cause huge damage. It's just that in cyber, they can do even more damage than 9-11. Uh, so, but there are certain similarities. We do have, I mean, Al-Qaeda and these criminal networks work basically subcontract form uh, both of them do. They're not necessarily state uh, originated. Uh, the ultimate source of an attack can be a state actor, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, then we have quasi-crime networks. Then we have what is known as uh, student hackers. There's a whole sort of a whole realm of student hackers who live in Shanghai around People's Liberation Army Unit 61398 
which is again a big source of all kinds of hacking and there is this deniability always available because they're just students in a dormitory it's just the dormitory seems to be very funnily close to the sort of unit that deals with these things in the PLA and uh, if you want to read all about it Mondiant a security company re computer security company released a report in the spring on this so I mean, there are all kinds of issues that we have to have to look at now. Now, the other side of this whole sort of <laughs> this whole world is that governments around the world are slowly but surely waking up to the need to protect their critical information structure. Um, uh, and as we are doing all of this, we have to also realize that the bad guys have also woken up to the internet revolution, not only in terms of inflicting damage on others, but in fact the wonderful opportunity to, to follow their own citizens. Um, in other words, undemocratic authoritarian governments are no less tech savvy than, uh, than enlightened people in uh, Silicon Valley or here in uh, Silicon Alley in New York. Uh, as the Arab Spring demonstrated, the promise of free, uncensored online communications was crucial to the, to, for the revolution to proceed, but you can do all kinds of things, first and foremost, and most obviously just shut down the Internet. But, in, but when you, for a better overview of how, in fact, authoritarian, totalitarian governments have started using the web to stifle dissent, I would recommend uh, Yevgeny Morozov's book, The Net Delusion, The Dark Side of Internet Freedom, which, in which he basically recounts how authoritarian governments use the internet, in fact, to go after people, to find out what they're thinking, what they're doing. Uh, in Russia recently, uh, some uh, citizens had managed to take pictures of government officials with very, 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 very expensive private castles, I mean, clearly, I mean, millions and millions of times more, costing more than the salary they received. And what happened, uh, they were found, they were put in jail. So you can see that uh, you can use the Internet to harass human rights, environmental campaigners, people who launch online petitions. So we see that there are cyber and real worlds that are also converging in this area. Uh, now. We do have to th worry about this, the amount of political capital that is invested to restrict, censor, and, and control the Internet is, I think, an increasing problem. Uh, my country, which, let's put this way, the U.S. is ranked number two in Internet freedom in the world. <laughs> uh, well, was, I mean, at least the most recent rating. But uh, nonetheless, we realize that um, here again, CC folks, uh, we're in the state where we are all, uh, but especially we, are the island of Melos and Thucydides where the strong do what they will and the weak do what they must. And in fact, those who are powerful in, uh, in uh, cyber can do all kinds of nasty things and we have to worry. Uh, this whole sort of area that we look at right now, and before I get to NSA, but if we look at this whole area, you realize that what is missing in all of this is any kind of genuine regulation, uh, any kind of a genuine set of laws. Uh, there have been attempts. Um, one attempt which has been, uh, which actually has encompassed virtually, which has been acceded to by virtually all of the liberal democracies in the world, which is about a third of the world, uh, is called the Budapest Convention. It originally came out of the Council of Europe, but quickly the United States, Canada, Japan, the Philippines, all kinds of other, South Korea all acceded, which basically says when it comes to cyber crime, cyber attacks, the, the countries that accede to this uh, uh, will commit themselves to assist in prosecution of people who do engage in cybercrime. The problem is that the, the, the countries that are the sources of most of these attacks, in fact, have not exceeded. And so, and in fact, there's, I mean, these are the countries that often have collusion. So, I mean, we're not going to get Syria, Iran, China, or Russia, unfortunately, in the next period of time, acceding to something that would obligate them or commit them to, in fact, pursue cyber 
criminals whose attacks or whose credit card theft or any of these other things emanate from their territory. Um, so basically what it comes down to is the, the family of liberal democracies have a set of rules that they've acceded to. Um, the, uh, the countries that are not part of the family of liberal democracies with human rights, free and fair elections, rule of law, and all that good stuff that we love, those countries, in fact, are becoming the places that are doing the damage to us. Uh, now, with, with this somewhat scary picture, of course, there are a number of options. Uh, if we, the one option that is not available to us, though it would work, is the Luddite option. Uh, the Luddite option would be that we say, okay, no more smartphones, no more iPads, we go offline, um, and we just give that up. Then you're not subject to attack. Of course, no one's going to do that. In fact, to think, think of what life, I mean, people are old geezers like me, uh, you know, when think, I lived two-thirds of my life without, uh, without any of this stuff, mobile phones, and we all had fixed-line phones. Uh, I mean, it's, it's unimaginable to me, and when I think of my son, uh, who's grown up I mean, uh, in this era, who was, uh, who, was on an, who was on a computer from the first day he could sort of put his fingers on it, uh, it's not, none of you who are under 40 can imagine life without a computer. And I'm pushing 60 here, and I can't imagine life without a computer. So we have to... Uh, we, that's not an option. So we're, if we don't have a, a rollback, a technological rollback, then uh, we need to think in other terms in the future. Um, those countries that rank low, that is to have good scores on the Transparency International Corruption Index, that means that uh, they're not very corrupt where they have rule of law. Uh, we've, also, we've, we've actually perhaps put ourselves in a bind because we've built our societies with a solid firewall between the private sector and the public sector. We don't have the kind of collusion between uh, ministers who also happen to be head of the uh, telecommunications company, which is a common phenomenon in a lot of countries. Uh, we have to rethink the kinds of things we do to protect ourselves. Um, we have to think that's one issue because the private sector is under even greater attack than governments or private individuals. Another issue that we have to deal with is we have to really understand that what used to be called critical infrastructure, roads, water systems, power systems, no longer are critical, informa uh, critical infrastructure system. They are all critical information uh, infrastructure systems. And that we, if we think about national security in whatever country you are, you have to think about your about the CII, the critical information infrastructure, uh, that that is really, the, our societies rely too much or so much on inf information systems that we have to pay far more attention to d dealing with those things. Um, third, we need to rethink how we talk about cybersecurity. In NATO, you know, we have interoperability. So that means you can take an American missile and you put it under a French Mirage jet and you just clips in there and the French fighter goes off and fires the button and the U.S. missile goes off and attacks whatever it's supposed to attack. When it comes to cyber, we all think in terms of intelligence. That's the, that paradigm is that you share nothing with anyone. Of course, we found out there was the five eyes, you know, the U.S., Canada, U.K., Australia, New Zealand. The Anglosphere does communicate among our, themselves a little more. But basically, we don't really share any information among ourselves. So if we find in Estonia a new virus, we can be nice guys and say, here's a nice, here's a virus, folks. But there's no obligation even in NATO to say, let's, you know, by the way, here's this new problem. Um, so. We do report to NATO, not other people don't do that, but I think one of the mindset changes we need in security policy thinking is that when it comes to cyber, we need far more coordination. That is a very difficult thing to achieve. Um, and I would say, again, after NSA, it may become even more difficult to achieve that because the amount of distrust uh, is, is enormous. Um, since I'm running out of time, and you want to ask some questions. Uh, let me say, let me just address the, uh, 
the Snowden NSA issue, which is really, I think, one of the sort of uh, may have disastrous consequences for everything. Uh, individual privacy and individual, individual rights are fundamental in democratic societies. The argument that I don't have anything to hide, let them snoop on me as much as they want, is actually rather dangerous. Um, it is dangerous because it assumes that governments and agencies and government agencies always and in all circumstances act ethically, morally, and lawfully. Sad truth is, as we know from history, they don't. Um, so your founding fathers here in the United States, being well versed in their luck, uh, were rather prudent when they established the principles behind also Montesquieu, I should say, checks and balances and democratic control of the government so that governments do not become destructive <clears throat> engines for the establishment of despotism. The NSA and any intelligence agency does what it has to do, such as collecting information on various people at home and abroad. As long as this takes place legally and ethically, ensuring oversight and transparency, this is part of life. You know, countries spy. They follow what's going on. It is, in fact, a necessary part of a modern nation state because all the other guys are doing it to you, so you better do it back yourself. Uh, so we're far from Woodstock in international affairs. That really dates me. But nonetheless, um, that the fact that countries spy on each other is not news. Um, and I assume that Snowden had a rough estimate of what the NSA does when he joins its ranks. But the problem is that uh, when you exceed those the sort of generally accepted norms, and then you end up with the kind of situation that we're in today. And uh, it, it's not enough to say that if you're a U.S. citizen, which is, you, are, you have your constitutional guarantees. Yes, that's true. On the other hand, uh, when you say that, that, oh, you U.S. citizens have no problems, don't worry, that doesn't really reassure the rest of the world, and it doesn't help the image of the United States, frankly. So, but, of course, there are a few other things we have to keep in mind in this. One of them is that one's own behavior online is so chaotic, so irresponsible, that really what the NSA does, yes, it looks bad, but actually everyone is doing making life very easy for them. Uh, I like, okay, I mean, think of the app. How many of you have smartphones? Who, does anyone not have a smartphone? Okay, my God. <laughs> you must be in cyber defense. No, it's, um, okay, if you don't have a smart, I mean, if everyone has a smartphone, and you have your apps, and you download these things for free. These are things, you know, the app is something some, a couple of guys, girls, geeks have all been sitting there figuring something out and they put it together and they put it on, you can just download it for free. Now do you really think people, the world is so full of good Samaritans that they're simply making up apps, sweating bullets to create something so that there will be something out there for free? No, they are monetizing the data that they acquire from your use of the app. You know, every day I go on a photocracy and tell them how many push-ups I did and how, many, how much I lifted. Uh, well, they're using all that. It's a free app. Um, I mean, there, and there are millions of these things. Uh, that's all going out there. And in fact, uh, you, people know more about you than new, you know about yourself. So there's a new book called Big Data, which I would highly recommend, except in my encroaching Alzheimer's, I forgot the author's name, but in any case, uh, it's called Big Data, you can find it on Amazon, written by a Harvard professor with a hyphenated German name and a former editor of The Economist. But they have this example there. There's a company that serves, sells, does direct mails, mailings to pregnant women based on the, their acute knowledge of the purchasing preferences of pregnant women over the period of the pregnancy. And so, you know, they, and so, and their data, their input comes from the credit card use of people. And based on credit card swipes, they figured out 
I mean, they figure out that this person is two months pregnant, five months pregnant, and then appropriately to the degree of pregnancy, they send a direct mail saying, buy this product. Well, then there was this story where, in fact, uh, they got an irate phone call from a father saying, how dare you send my daughter, 15-year-old daughter, these things? You know, this is, and, and the company goes, oh my God, this being the very litigious USA, they're imagining $100 million fines and things. And, and so they say, we better call the guy up and apologize and make him an offer. So they call the guy up and he goes, oh, I'm very sorry, she actually is pregnant. Now that is, that is the power of big data, and none of that is going on voluntarily except you're just swiping your credit card and it registers what you, with your email address, ha you have bought this product. So you are all putting up data all the time, and it is being used, it is being monetized, and it is being monitored. So lest we get too carried away with the National Security Agency, uh, let's keep in mind that it's all out there and what we I mean, we have to realize this. We have to be educated enough to know that this is, is uh, a problem. And, of course, when you do all of this, organizations like the NSA uh, are basically like kids in a candy shop because they're, you know, they have all those, those data out there, and they're going, wow, what do we pick? What do we see? What, do we, what can we get? I mean, can you blame them? Because the private companies are doing it anyway. So uh, every time you put something silly uh, put something silly on, the, uh, on Facebook, uh, all your little selfies, Instagrams. Um, you're, not really, uh, you're not really doing uh, yourself much of a favor. I'm not arguing that you have to avoid that, but you have to be, do that in, with the full consciousness that you are putting your own data up there for anyone to use. So, I mean, some people say that the whole notion of privacy in the digital age has become outdated. Um, Maybe it has. Uh, it, it would run against the grain of the uh, sort of the development of the liberal tradition of, and the rights of the individual. But let me just end up because I'm running out of time and I have to go soon. But basically, as I said in the beginning, we're dealing with a triangulation between three issues security, privacy, and then the free flow of information. How you regulate that, how you manage that triangulation will be the key, I would argue, to, and to the future of uh, IT in a liberal democracy. I mean, there are ways of doing it so you're, you don't have a liberal democracy. There are plenty of countries where, I mean, there's one country, our neighbor, where every ISP feeds right through the FSB, which is their sort of secret service, uh, by law, 2003, it says you can't have an ISP unless it goes directly through, the pipeline goes through the Secret Service. I mean, so, I mean, there are ways of dealing with these things that are different from ours, but I don't think we would want that in a country of a liberal democracy, be it Estonia or the United States, where, where, the, uh, where your, every ISP feeds directly into the FBI, for example. But, what we have done, we think we've, as, is actually works fairly well, and what has enabled us to, uh, to offer the services that we do and safely and securely to the point that it's never been breached, is that <clears throat> and the key is that you have a secure identity. Basically, on the Internet, you can be a dog, as the cliché goes, to make it more real. If you're living in a bad neighborhood um, and you have an intercom, uh, used to be a bad neighborhood around here, no longer is, but when I went here it was a bad neighborhood. Someone not, rings the doorbell and it's your girlfriend who says, it's me, honey, and then you buzz her in. Uh, but it turns out that someone has a recording and has been sitting there and it says, it's me, honey, and then in walk in three thugs, right? I mean, that's the problem with the Internet, to put it sort of pictorially. Uh, so secure identity is one of them. You have to know who you're talking to, and whoever's talking to you has to know who you are. What that requires is, a, uh, is an authentication of identity, uh, which we have in our country, to get really technical, because I see some nodding heads who are technically sophisticated. It is a, a, a two-factor two uh, public key infrastructure at 200, 2,048 bits. 
That probably means very little to most of you, but you can just think that uh, Lava Bit was shut down by the U.S. government a couple of weeks ago because they were offering Snowden 512 bits, so four times higher security we offer to all of our citizens, all of our residents, uh, so we can have secure communications. All of our services, from, digital, from looking at your medical records to all your medical records to your get your prescriptions to doing your taxes, taxes online, are also done through the secure identity system that we have. The, uh, many countries have been extremely interested in this. Some of them have adopted it, um, have adopted our system. Finland is shortly about to go over to our system. Uh, curiously enough, the, the Anglosphere, as I mentioned it, or the Five Eyes, the U.S., U.K., Canada, Australia, and New Zealand have a visceral rejection of IDs, and, uh, which is understandable, you know, kind of give me liberty and give me death and don't tread on me and all of that good stuff that we all know that we went to high school in, in the United States, and it's completely understandable. On the other hand, if that is your attitude and you refuse to have a clear identity online, then you face the other consequences of someone posing as you, as someone stealing your credit card data, as someone doing all kinds of things to you. So that is a choice that, that countries face. Do you have a secure identity and do you not have a secure identity? Um, but that's part of triangulating the issue of freedom, security, and privacy, because our data are private, we also have a number of additional factors I won't go into now, but among other things, for example, by law in my country, you own your own data. No one, you are the legal owner of your data, which means that you also have the right to see and can see, not only the right, but you have the physical ability to see everyone who has accessed your data, which is whatever the government has on you. Um, there's a related issue, which I won't get into at length, but for the nodding heads in the audience, the other one, of course, is, uh, is integrity. And we also uh, have a, uh, uh, have a keyless, uh, keyless identity system, which basically where the problem of Stuxnet comes in and uh, the other related systems, it's not malware. They're just changing what goes into these computer programs. And uh, we are also going over to a system where we attach a unique identity to every little piece of data that goes into something. So that there you have, you have the firewall or the, the great wall, whatever wall, which is provided by the identity authentication, and then you have the integrity of the data going between from one place to another. If you do that, then it's, you can't be, or it's very, very difficult for someone to break into your system, and you can be sure that the people or the governments or the instances you're talking to online are really who they are. That, I think, is the way to go. Whether it's politically possible for you to do so in the United States, I don't know, but we would recommend it. <laughs> but at least that way, uh, I can be sure that people are not reading those mails that I use using the system that I have. They're not breaking into my computer because they can't. Uh, and I think that so the solution to the technological difficulties or the difficulties caused by technology in modern society, the solutions will perforce also be technological solutions. And I'm sorry to have gotten so technical, but it really does all go back to lock. And I would say what we really need is a social contract today between the citizens and the government on how to proceed uh, the government's obligation in the case of market failure, which we do see in the case of cybersecurity, is to provide a secure environment for for its citizens and the citizens on the other end have to, in fact, agree to it that they will participate in a system that provides secure identity. So it really goes back to the two treatises of government, which is one of the best things I ever read when I was at Columbia. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Ilvis. You've been very generous with your time. We have time for two very quick questions, if we may. Can I invite you uh, to the microphone, please?
please, please step up to the microphone and please uh, state your name, your affiliation, and also a reminder that you are being live streamed and this will be for the record. Yeah. Yep, please. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Finn Vigeland. I'm a senior in Columbia College. Um, it, so, you know, you say in, in Estonia you've, you've met, you know, the whole country's on, on Wi-Fi. 25% 20, of the last election people voted in the internet. Um, is, is something, like, do you envision some, a system like that ever possible in the United States where, like, my parents don't want to do online banking, where they don't want to create a Facebook, where, is that something, is that possible in a country as large as this and as skeptical as this? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll, I mean, uh, con the initial conditions are different. I mean, we were completely out of it having gone through 50 years of Soviet occupation and our mindset was let's do something good, big, and well. We were willing to take steps that other countries weren't. We basically, because our technology was so old, we just skipped the whole intermediary, what became legacy technology. We just went into the newest thing. And for so many people, it represented a way of getting out of poverty. I mean, I didn't mention here, but I mean, Skype was invented in this, by four guys in Estonia. First they invented Kazaa, then they were indicted by the United States, then the United States relented, then they invented Skype. Uh, and the success of Skype then became a motivator for people to do this. And I would argue that in addition to the general w desire to skip over a lot of the in between stuff that led to people embracing new technology as their side was that Skype was for so many young people such a great example of what you can do, you know, just with a little bit of technical knowledge and thinking and being creative that, uh, that technology, we don't have the technophobia that we see in a lot of places. Uh, and of course, uh, the secure online identity has become kind of a, a thing we're proud of. Thank you. We're good. Yes, sir. Um, good afternoon. My name is Benjamin Hanser. I'm a first year student in Columbia College. Um, you spoke at length about how um, commercial software and commercial websites are snooping on people. What do you think the advantages and disadvantages of open source software are in regards to cybersecurity? Well, our, our entire system is open source, non proprietary. Uh, if you want to read more about it, if you know anything about computer science, look at www.ria.ee, and then up in the upper right-hand corner, you can click ENG for English, and then you can read what the system works, how the system works. But we started from day one saying we are, well, basically, you know, we're poor. I mean, do you know anything about computers? Am I, are you a geek so I can explain? Or? Sort of. And basically what we did was we adopted a... Um, uh, an enterprise service bus system because we couldn't create a cloud because we were too poor to have a cloud so we ended up with a distributed system that everything was separate and then we had to find a way of making having them communicate with each other so we established this enterprise service bus and then we encoded it all with a secure authenticated ID that's basically in a nutshell what we did but that I mean is a this is pure serendipity we were just too broke at the time to have a big cloud so we said, let's use the little servers we have and connect them all up, but this creates security problems, so let's solve the security problem. Uh, so in this case, uh, yes, that's what we did. Excellent. And we have time for one more question. Sir. Um, hello, Your Excellency. Uh, thank you for coming to Columbia. Uh, my name is Ezra Wishograd. I am a uh, second year at Columbia College. Um, if I may digress for a moment, um, I have a quick question on uh, Estonia's Russian minority. Um, I was wondering, um, that I realize that to gain Estonian citizenship, if you're a Russian in Estonia who came after 1940, um, it requires some form of uh, knowledge of the Estonian language. Although the Estonian language is, of course, linguistically incredibly difficult unless you know Finnish. I'm wondering if... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me just interrupt. I mean, language space is symmetrical. Well, I mean, it's a Uralic language, okay. which is particularly difficult. Yeah, but we, we are running short on time, so could oh, you so, ask right, your sorry, question sorry, of yeah, sorry. please? My question is, do you think your administration is doing enough to linguistically integrate the Russian minority? Great. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Well, I mean, young Estonians speak Estonian. I mean, I mean, that's a, but I would, I would argue with you that language space is symmetrical. To you, it is incredibly difficult. Well, if you're an Estonian, an Indo-European language is incredibly difficult. So, I mean... Uh, 
and all this, I mean, what, we have 14 cases, yes, well, those are simply postpositions, which are prepositions that are at the back of a word, by, with, from, in, or on, it's not that difficult. Now, I mean, basically, I mean, in young people, why should someone come and occupy a country and get citizenship without learning the language of the country? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we're out of time. Uh, President Illis, I want to thank you on behalf of Columbia University and its affiliates for delivering that tour de force. Uh, perhaps we'll even have to add a couple of weeks to the CC curriculum uh, to incorporate your insights. Maybe we could have you teach a MOOC. Uh, but you are always welcome um, to come here. We hope you'll visit us again. And please join me in thanking President Illis. Well, I really like to thank Columbia because basically it's all thanks to this place that I can do this today. So thank you guys. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats as we escort the president from the building. Thank you.